Hello, and welcome to this afternoon's program, Scholarly Communications and Open Access, Library Collections in the 21st Century, with Laurel Crawford, Manager of Collections Strategy. I'm Erin Joukowsky, Senior Associate Director of Lifelong Learning with the Office of Alumni Relations at Johns Hopkins University. This ongoing series, Lunch with the Libraries, is made possible through partnerships with the Sheridan Libraries, the Friends of Johns Hopkins University Libraries, and the Office of Alumni Relations, Lifelong Learning. Thank you all for joining us. Following the presentation by our guest speaker, I encourage you to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to respond to as many questions as we can in the time that is allowed. And now, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Jim Williams, member and former president of the Friends of the Libraries. Jim? Thank you, Erin, and hello, everyone. On behalf of the Friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries, I am delighted to welcome you to this month's Lunch with the Libraries, our ongoing speaker series that spotlights the unique collections, pioneering initiatives, and outstanding staff of the Sheridan Libraries. We are grateful for the partnership of our co-sponsors, the Johns Hopkins Office of Alumni Relations Lifelong Learning, for their support in making the Lunch with the Library series possible. Founded in 1941, the Friends of Johns Hopkins University Libraries is one of the oldest university library support groups in the United States. We provide financial support and advocacy for the Sheridan Libraries and organize events like this one to bring members of the campus and the wider community to Hopkins Libraries. The friends include people like you, alumni, faculty, staff, students, parents, and community members. If you are not already a member of the Friends, I encourage you to join us to help ensure that the libraries remain one of the university's strongest assets, truly the heart of intellectual life at Johns Hopkins. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Laurel Crawford. Laurel is the manager of collection strategies at Johns Hopkins University Libraries. She creates strategies to develop JHU library collections to more fully embrace open access principles while adapting to the rapid changes in the scholarly communication landscape. Laurel has 17 years of experience developing collections at major research libraries, most recently the University of North Texas and Mississippi State University. Her professional research interests include collection assessment, vendor relations, and library leadership. Before I leave you all, I urge you to make sure you visit our latest friend-sponsored e exhibition at the Peabody Library entitled Women of the Book. Now, Laura, it is my pleasure to turn the screen over to you. Hi, everybody. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So let's see if I can do that successfully. There we go. So I think you guys can see my screen. So here we go. This is my uh, talk that we're going to listen to today, uh, Scholarly Communications and Open Access Library Collections in the 21st Century. So uh, hello from me. I am Laurel Crawford. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to speak to you about academic library collections. I've been doing this for a really long time, and I'm really lucky to work here at Hopkins, where they pay me to think deeply about library collections and how we can best support researchers doing the important work happening at Hopkins. A couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, they mentioned that we are going to have Q&A at the end, and I, I encourage you to uh, submit your questions because to me, I'm really eager to hear from you uh, about your questions about libraries and library collections. Um, and also, I do want to note that I do have a couple of tiny little ferocious dogs in the room with me. Hopefully, they will remain silent, uh, but I do apologize in advance if the mail carrier comes by and they freak out. Probably won't happen, but just in case, I'm sorry in advance. So, uh, 
During my talk today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about how the scholarly communication landscape and the academic publishing marketplace is evolving. It's changing very rapidly due to emerging technologies, social media, and the changing needs of researchers. Basically, the societal forces that we see at work around us all the time are affecting academia and academic libraries. But I'll also share about how we, librarians, are working with scholars and publishers to provide both access to research communications and publishing opportunities in new ways. And I'll talk about some new developments that are increasingly affecting both researchers and libraries. So first, let's see, there we go. So what is, here's a question for you to mull on your own. What is an academic library collection? Is it a giant pile of things? Is it acres of books, stacks of journals, shelves with globes and atlases and map and maps and art and so forth? Shelves to the ceiling of a library with many stories? Let's think about this, just the Sheridan libraries. This doesn't even include the music library, the medical library, the international school or anything else. Just our libraries contains more than 3.7 million tangible books. 170,000 journal titles and 900,000 ebooks. But is the collection more than that? I ask you. Well, I'm a librarian. I have an answer for you. You knew this was coming because I'm a librarian and I have an answer for everything. So, one of my professional guiding principles is thinking of library collections as a service rather than a pile of things. When I teach library school students, this is what I tell them, consider what a collection does rather than what a collection is. Collections are a means to an end, not an end unto itself. A collection never used might as well never exist. The first thing that we learn on the first day of library school is this aphorism from one of the founding fathers of library science, that books are for use. That's as opposed to the libraries of your in the olden days when monasteries would hoard away books and no one was allowed to read them. <clears throat> Today, because modern collections about more than just books, we would say collections are for use. Now, libraries operate under constraints. We all have it, no matter how big of a school we work for, we have constraints on budget, staff time and space. Scholarly output has vastly increased. I'll tell you more about that in a little while. We cannot possibly house, acquire, uh, sorry, acquire and then house and then make available all of the things. With that in mind, what should librarians do? We make difficult decisions using evidence about the needs of our users. So we're thinking all of the time about the needs of the researchers that use our collections. Now I will say that there is more than one right way to build a collection in an academic library. There's no one size fits all collection that is right for every group of scholars and every group of researchers. We librarians use a variety of sources of information, methods and judgment calls, frankly, to select materials for library collections. And something important to me is that librarians have a, an important and special role in helping all users not just the users who know what they want and know how to ask for it. So our job is to ensure that the collection contains materials for the silent user, the inexperienced researcher, the person whose needs are not mainstream. And we also like to provide materials for serendipitous discovery. Even if you don't know you need it, there it is for you. The theme of this talk is change. Everything is changing. You know this. It's happening in our everyday lives as well. It's so much change, piles and piles and piles of change. So that is the, is the theme of this talk, and you will see me bringing it up over and over again. So the first way that things are really changing is that the researchers that we serve, our users, are their needs are changing. <clears throat> so for one thing, Scholarly output, that is the production of articles, books, and other forms of scholarly communication is really increasing. In fact, according to some studies, scientific publication output has doubled every nine years in the decades since World War II. That is frankly kind of crazy. Everything is also interdisciplinary now. 
I've noticed this anecdotally for me. Like Jim said, I've been working in libraries, in academic libraries for a long time. I've personally observed how more and more researchers are consuming and producing work outside of what I would consider their home department where their job lives. But we can also measure this phenomenon. Someone went back and looked at um, citations outside of uh, the researcher's home field, their main field, and we can see that over time, citations have increasingly become more diverse across different disciplines. So for the researcher, when they are increasingly engaged in interdisciplinary work, that may mean a few things to them. They may have feel pressure to uh, become uh, fluent in the literature in other adjacent fields to their own. That's difficult. Uh, they may have difficulty communicating to colleagues the impact of their own work because it's unusual and it's outside the mainstream flow of their discipline. But on the other hand, they may also experience more opportunities to collaborate, publish, be creative, and apply for funding. Another thing that's changing is that uh, researchers are using emerging technologies to do their research and to produce new kinds of content. There are way too many examples of emerging technologies affecting research right now, but I have an example of one that kind of affects both researchers and libraries, and that's called text and data mining, or we sometimes shorten that to TDM. TDM is the analysis using specialized computational tools of huge data sets. And it's really interesting because TDM does not, um, is not necessarily applied to traditional data analysis fields. In fact, lots of folks are using TDM to address questions in the humanities and social sciences in new ways. So, those data sets that they can use using text and data mining um, can be free form, natural language type of materials, or it could be structured numerical data. Um, some of the examples of materials people are using text and data mining on are old newspapers that have been digitized, old books that have been digitized. We've seen TDM used on texts from the Middle Ages or the Renaissance that have been digitized. Social media posts, DNA sequences, anything like that that is a large set of information can be analyzed using up-to-date modern tools. They scour the data for patterns, they look for patterns. Um, an example of patterns that one might find in a textual data set might be word frequency, common phrases, associated words, and so forth. TDM is an emerging technology that has become so common or common enough that we now write it into library licenses for electronic materials. We ensure upfront prior to purchase that our researchers will have the right to do text and data mining over the corpus of materials included in any product that we buy. So that's just one example of emerging technologies that are affecting uh, the changing needs of researchers. I know this is probably not a surprise to you, but social networking and social sharing is also affecting academia, just like it's affecting every other part of our lives. Um, a couple of, the, it, it is specific though to academia. So we have a couple of examples of that. One example is preprint repositories. This is a very important part of um, the emerging new parts of the scholarly communications landscape. Uh, an example of a preprint repository you might have heard of that's really big is Archive, that's A-R-X-I-V, Archive. Um, they're growing in importance, they're growing in use. They allow researchers to share their work prior to peer review, prior to publication. This, this um, allows researchers to uh, rapidly disseminate their work. It does allow them to kind of claim that they've had an idea first, which is kind of interesting. They can collect peer feedback prior to publication, and it also provides access to work pre-peer review for people that don't have access to the later published and rather expensive version of the work. I'll talk more about these issues in a few minutes when I get into open access, but um, Archive is an example of social networking, social sharing. Another example of that is that academics have their own social networks that are specific to the work that's being done by researchers. Uh, one of them is, an example is called ResearchGate. Another one is academia.edu. You may have heard of these. Um, they can upload papers. They can find collaborators. They can discuss ideas. It's kind of cool, but these are 
providing opportunities, but also putting pressure on researchers. It's just another way their lives have changed. Um, I also want to point out, this kind of begs the question, if we've got social networking and we can just share everything online, why do we need publishers and libraries anymore? I have an answer for that. That is an uncomfortable question for librarians to ask themselves, but we have answers. We are still necessary, but it does enter one's mind when one thinks about the internet and the avail availability of things on it. So another thing that we see uh, changing needs of users is that um, scholars increasingly need materials reflective of the vast range of human experience and research, not just the kinds of materials that were traditionally collected for in academic libraries many years ago, which reflect, reflected a primarily Western elite white and male perspective. And they also need a diversity of formats. So they need materials outside of uh, the traditional containers like books and journal articles. Some examples of things that I have personally bought for library collections in the last few years, I'm gonna rattle these off, data sets, videos, metadata, art, code, multimedia, facsimiles of medieval texts, real medieval texts, old formats like vinyl records and cartridge games from the 80s, digitized copies of very old journal articles, ebook packages, technical standards, conference proceedings, and on and on. I will stop, you're welcome. They need all kinds of things. They need all of the things. And it is our job as a library to help them get access to. So libraries, something important to think about is that libraries are at the forefront of addressing a lot of these changes, but these changes are not just for libraries to deal with. These are societal changes and all of academia changes. So let's talk about some changes in the scholarly communication landscape. Like everything, scholarly communication is changing, uh, sorry, it's rapidly increasing in size and speed. The scope and scale of what your average researcher must ingest is staggering. There are also many more business models, many more journal titles, more publishers, more of everything for libraries to consider purchasing. There are additional pressures on researchers. They must now think in new ways about their role as both consumers of information and producers of information. They've always known that they are both consumers and producers of information, but nowadays it's more high stakes because there is money involved in more parts of that those relationships, both at the point of production and the point of consumption. I'll get into more details about that in a few minutes, but it is a little bit difficult for researchers. Another thing to be cognizant of when we're talking about the scholarly communications landscape is that there are additional governmental regulations coming into effect. Again, I'll talk about this more in a few minutes, but governments around the world have an interest in funding research. And therefore, they also have an interest in ensuring that the outputs, outputs of that research are publicly usable. They create regulations that then the scholars who they fund have to adhere to, and that can be difficult. And then lastly, something that's really important to me as a librarian who works on purchasing materials is that a big change in the scholarly communications landscape is academic publishing markets and economies. Vendors who sell the third-party materials that libraries acquire for use by their researchers um, are a vast group. They, have, uh, they include, but they're not limited to publishers, traditional publishers. But one thing to be aware of is that they've bought each other and they have acquired emerging products until more than 50% of the academic market is controlled by five main publishers. And you've probably heard of them because they are like that famous. Elsevier, Wiley, Taylor & Francis, Springer Nature, and Sage. They control over 50% of the market. And I wanna point something else out interesting these two guys, Elsevier and Clarivate, are the two most prominent database vendors for academic libraries and academic use. And I have taken the liberty of listing just some, a smattering of the products that they each control. And if you have been doing any work in academia in the last 
several years, you will recognize a few of these names. They are, uh, they control vast swaths of uh, tools, databases, and content that help researchers do their research. Uh, some of them are tools, some of them are content, and publish their research. Um, I think also it's worth pointing out that Elsevier also controls a number of products that are related to uh, clinical care. So doctors at the bedside providing actual clinical care to patients. Um, these, this is a lot <laughs> for these two companies to control. And one thing to be aware of here is that sometimes we talk about wanting to extract scholarly communication to some extent from this marketplace because they do, these publishers do have so much control over the money that libraries have to spend. But as you can see, it will be very difficult for us to take some of that control back or extract some of the scholarly communications from these vendors because they're so embedded and intertwined. And this makes me sad. So we're gonna stop looking at this list and we're gonna go back and look at these beautiful trees and take a deep breath. And then we're gonna think about some other things that are changing. We have university presses and smaller scholarly societies. They're also <coughs> under heavy pressure from the marketplace. Uh, how people consume and pay for scholarly monographs has changed quite a lot. For example, libraries, academic libraries, used to buy lots of copies of, of scholarly monographs, and that's not as true anymore. Um, data is a big deal for scholarly communications companies and vendors, particularly Clarivate and Elsevier. Collecting, analyzing, packaging, repackaging, and selling to different markets that's what they do with the data that they um, collect. It has become incredibly lucrative. Some vendors have shifted an emphasis from publishing as an end in, in itself to publishing as a means to gather data about academia and then sell it back to us. It's interesting. Lastly, Another very important thing to know about the scholarly communications landscape is that it's global in a way that it wasn't before. So scholarly publishing is now a worldwide market. Researchers are producing and consuming vast quantities of materials outside of the traditional Western market. Uh, that was the case a few decades ago. So again, libraries are at the forefront of addressing these changes, but they're market-wide changes. They're academia-wide changes. Here's something to be aware of too, is that the scholarly communication life cycle, and here I'm gonna get into more details about the money and how this affects researchers day to day and how, and how libraries are dealing with it. Here you see the scholarly communication life cycle. This is a very standard view of it. We have people um, in, uh, using uh, information, they publish it, it's disseminated, we preserve it, and then they reuse it and it's kind of a cycle. Libraries, tended and traditionally to spend time and money on the three yellow squares here. So uh, disseminating, collecting, preserving, and helping people reuse information. That's where we focused our efforts. We were not as involved on the side of researchers creating research, um, evaluating other people's research, or publishing their research. But now, let's see, libraries are being asked more and more, and universities as a whole, but sometimes through the libraries, to be pr providing funding at a different point in the cycle, which is at the point of publication. Um, this is due to not a not new model, but it's a rapidly evolving business model called open access, or OA. It's fueled by technology changes and changing demands from researchers. So, when we librarians are looking at uh, the world of scholarly communication, we're thinking, okay, not only do we have to purchase for people to read, but we have to also purchase publishing opportunities for them now too. That is a scary prospect for some libraries because uh, again, we are operating under constraints. Again, libraries at the forefront of addressing this problem, but it is a academy, a lot, it's an academy wide problem that needs to be addressed. So let's talk more about what open access really is. 
Here's a really standard broad definition of what open access, and I'm going to call it OA, so that's what I'm talking about. OA refers to freely available digital online information. It's free of charge to anybody who wants to read it worldwide. It has less, usually has less restrictive copyright and licensing barriers than traditionally published works, both for the users and for the authors. Um, this makes information, scholarly research, available to anybody even if they're not associated with studying or working at a wealthy institution. This is as opposed to what I call paywall, meaning the researcher or the library has to pay to read something. So this information is free. However, open access requires, depends on some kind of financial support at the point of production rather than at the point of consumption as in traditional models. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes that financial support at point of publication is done in the form of charging the actual author a fee called an OA fee. It's often called an APC or article processing charge, which can be very expensive. So basically the researcher has done all the work, but now has to turn around and pay a fee to allow their article to become published open access so that anybody can read it. These fees are very expensive. In STEM fields, they're thousands of dollars. The highest one I know of personally right now is $11,390 for a single article to become published open access. It's a journal you've all heard of, and I'm not going to say the name, but they should be shamed. Uh, we also run a program where we're pro producing scholarly monographs, and those require even higher expenses because it's very expensive to produce a book, and it's about $15,000 per book. Why is open access important? Well, first of all, we saw this happen just recently with the COVID-19 epidemic, but we also uh, see it with uh, climate change. Uh, these and other emergency or very urgent situations uh, require rapid science, removing the paywalls between research and the researchers who need to read them removes an obstacle to sharing work quickly and equitably around the world. Lots of publishers opened up COVID-19 COVID uh, publications really fast so that those could be shared and reused really rapidly. OA also provides equitable access to information for less well-funded researchers. Information and communication should be available to researchers who are not associated with wealthy institutions, and particularly those who are located in areas of the world like the Global South with fewer resources. Also, another thing that's coming here and is increasing in importance that makes OA something everyone should pay attention to is that research organization funding policies are starting to require OA in a lot of instances. In fact, the White House just a couple of months ago released a memo. If you wanna read more about it, Google OSTP memo, that's the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. They uh, have now declared guidance that says that any federally funded research needs to be made immediately open access without embargo, and it covers all agencies, no matter how much funding they give out. That's a big deal. Uh, the EU has been doing this kind of thing for a long time, though, so a lot of our European colleagues are also operating under uh, funding policies that require open access. And a lot of non-governmental agencies also do that, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Anything they fund must be made open access. They don't want to pay for research that ends up behind a paywall. So again, libraries are at the forefront of supporting open access to information, but this is an effort that benefits all of humanity. So how are researchers affected by all these changes? Um, First of all, funding is a very important question. Every researcher is very concerned about the funding that they need to do their research. And in the past, the pain point came when they wanted to access information to read. For example, they needed a scholarly article. And so they would ask themselves, do I have money to buy this article, to subscribe to this journal, to buy this book that I need to read? Or maybe the library can get it for me. I'll suggest it to the library. Can they get access to it? Or maybe we could pull funding together like the library does and get access for everybody. 
However, nowadays, there is new pain points at the point of publication. So it's not just whether or not they can pay or afford to read to get the information that they need to consume, but it's also when they publish. So they are asking themselves questions like, do I have money to publish this article? Can the library fund me to publish this article? Or how can we pull money together so that everyone has funding to publish articles open access? That's a pain point, but they're also excited about the potentially broader reach and greater impact of what open access can do for their work. Imagine if your article is not paywalled, you can let anyone in the world read it. You can send it to everybody. Um, in fact, I've recently had a couple of conversations with Johns Hopkins researchers who produced material about Sub-Saharan Africa. And they were particularly excited about the opportunities that open access would allow for their colleagues in Africa and their study subjects in Africa to have access to the work that was produced with them uh, in a way that they were worried in the past when uh, information was paywalled, those folks wouldn't have had resources to access the products of the research they participated in. That's pretty cool. How are Johns Hopkins Library is responding to all this. Well, as usual, as we have always been doing for decades, centuries, we have been doing very broad and very deep library collecting focused on researcher needs. We are operating under constraints just like every other library in the world, but we're driven by the university mission to provide knowledge for the world. We are experimenting with new business models to support researchers at all points in the scholarly communication life cycle. In fact, we maintain a number of programs to financially support you, you, uh, JHU authors at point of publication of open access materials. After I finish speaking, I'll drop a link into the chat to a list of the programs that we run, but here's a couple of examples. We've made a deal with Cambridge University Press that any Hopkins affiliate can publish any open access article for free. So they're waiving those APC fees that are a few thousand dollars. No Hopkins person has to pay those. And so if you have questions about that, please just ask me or ask your librarian. We also run a program called the Tome Project, and that's to support open access monographs. And we uh, provide grants of up to $15,000 per title to help support open access publications of scholarly monographs by our faculty. Hopkins librarians are also working with other top tier schools and publishers to create workable purchasing models and cooperative deals for massive amounts of affordable content that we can uh, sustain over time. Sustainability of the cost of these materials is a big thing for us. And we're also taking a leading role within the university and with other libraries and organizations to advocate for a sustainable open future for all scholarly communications. So our big question was, what is a library collection? And I'm here to tell you today, we are not building piles of things. We're providing services to support researchers doing the important work happening at Hopkins. We practice thriving in this messy, ambiguous environment of library collections. It's just getting weirder and weirder. And it's okay. I tell myself that every day because it's a little hard, but it's fine. We're going to do this. Uh, we keep our eyes open for these big picture trends and changes. We cultivate partnerships outside of the library, within the academy, and with other libraries in the world. And we try to be more proactive than reactive. And so again, I think we should not ask what is a library collection, but rather how can we best serve researchers? So a couple of things to stay tuned if you're not like me and you don't sit around thinking deep thoughts about collections all day, every day. Uh, how can you stay tuned to what will happen next? A couple of things to look for in the news is um, that relate to open access, I would say, is to look for how open access helps combat disinformation. We all know that disinformation is a big problem these days. The more we can share facts and actual resources, the more we can support evidence-based decision-making by our policymakers. 
So the next time you click on a news story or any other type of thing that you see on social media, consider whether it goes to an open resource or if you hit a paywall. And right there, you're experiencing the benefits of open access. A second thing to look for are these urgent global problems like climate change and public health. These are two areas for which all of humanity will need rapid scientific development to engage with the global problems. The areas of the world, for example, that are going to be most impacted by climate change are the least likely to have resources to acquire and have access to scientific information. How can we best support the free flow of this important research information to all people who need it? Libraries, again, are at the forefront of addressing this problem, but it's a big problem for the academy, for the marketplace, it's for society. We can do this together. So that is the end of my talk. Here is my contact information. Um, my Twitter handle is there. I assume Twitter will be around for at least a couple more days, so feel free to follow me. <laughs> I do post about library things. Um, so I think it's time for Q&A, and I really would be eager to hear from y'all. I'm going to stop sharing my slide, and there we go. So, Erin. Yes, hi. hello. What a fantastic <laughs> presentation. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we are moving into the Q&A portion of our program, and I encourage all of our attendees to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A, which is located at the bottom of the screen. And we have a good amount of time, so I'm sure we can respond to as many questions as we can in the time available. Um, but I'm happy to kick off with this first question, Laurel. Uh, what data or input do you use to make decisions about how to spend the library's materials budget? And how do you collect and use that information? That's a great question, thank you. Um, I think this is of lots of concern to a lot of people. Um, I've had people ask me this kind of question about both academic libraries and all kinds of other libraries. Uh, how do you know what to purchase? How do you know what to go? How, how do you know who, whom to approach to make a deal? Um, well, first of all, we ask people. <laughs> we try to get information about users' needs, researchers' needs. That's a little bit hard for us because uh, the number of researchers are, is enormous, right? And their needs are so vast and diverse. Um, so we try to get as much subjective input as we can. I wanna tell each and every person here that you can contact your library, whether you are associated with an academic library, public library, whatever, contact your library and ask them for what you need. They need that kind of feedback. I promise you, your librarian wants to hear from you. Um, can't do it without you. But in lieu of that, uh, we also look at information about user needs that we can use as a proxy for what they need. So. One thing that we look at a lot is usage data. So if we already have a database, uh, we might be able to look and see how many times that database has been used. We can also look at that um, with any kind of electronic content like electronic journals, electronic books. Um, those are quite easy to find use data for. And I might say to myself, okay, if a book is getting used a lot, then people need it. <laughs> Therefore, maybe I'll buy a second copy of that book or maybe I'll buy more books on that topic. Uh, we can also do that with tangible items by looking at checkout statistics. So anything that we see that has been used either in the library or somebody has checked it out, we consider that evidence of need. So um, we also, of course, think about a lot of other extraneous things that aren't as patron-centered. Uh, which would be things like, how much do we have to pay? Is this price reasonable? Are they going to increase the price year after year? They do, um, so forth and so on. So there's a lot of things that we look for. We're concerned about patron privacy a lot. We look at information in the licenses. Uh, I have become an expert on uh, legal legalese in licenses in order to uh, no negotiate on behalf of all of our researchers the best way. So I hope that answers the question. Was that understandable? I get kind of jargony with that. No, answer. I thought that was great. Thank you. Um, and we have a question now from John. Um, he asks, is asking, how do libraries plan long-term storage as collections grow, especially with the diverse types of materials? 
Oh, that's a fantastic question. And one that is really close to Hopkins' heart right now because we are uh, working to prepare for a renovation of the main library. So the Eisenhower Library on campus will soon be renovated. And we had to move a lot of the collections in order to get ready for that construction. So we have a, a remote storage facility out in Laurel, which is, you know, uh, also my name, which is funny. But anyway, in Laurel, we, we have a remote storage facility. It is a, a, like a big warehouse. It is uh, climate controlled. The humidity is controlled. Um, there are special places in it for different types of materials, for example, like film and art so that they are preserved the best. Um, however, uh, one of the big concerns that collections librarians have to think about is space. Uh, if, if we have a collection we cannot adequately store and we cannot adequately care for it, we're not, we don't feel we're really doing our job. So sometimes we make decisions uh, to curate the collection to, uh, the, the, uh, so that we can best take care of the things we do have. Um, so we have constraints again on staff time and on money. We can't afford to buy, we can't afford to build five remote storage facilities. <laughs> we only have one, right? So um, that is one way we do that. Another way that I want to make sure everybody knows about is that libraries in total in the in the world are working together to ensure preservation of the scholarly record as we call it so we join programs that help libraries work together to ensure that there is a copy of every important thing somewhere in a safe place multiple copies in reality so we uh, even if we don't hold a copy here at Hopkins, we can rest assured that there is a copy somewhere that we can borrow for you. So I hope that answers your question, John. If not, please follow up and ask a, a follow-up question. <laughs> well, that was great. And it was great. So timely, you know, with the... With the <laughs> Um, so I have another, oh, we have another one coming in in the chat too, but I'll start with this one. Um, can you tell us more about how the library is working with publishers to design solutions to solve problems and what does that look like? Well, in my opinion, and this is something I think about all the time, it's very interesting to work with publishers. They, uh, so, sometimes those relationships can get contentious, um, but we try to keep it more like a partnership, more like a uh, getting toward the same goal rather than fighting. Um, they are uh, not all publishers at all, but some of the publishers are for-profit corporations. Some of them are owned by venture capitalists. Um, and that really conflicts sometimes with the purpose, mission, and outcomes desired for libraries. So sometimes we see a little bit of a conflict generated at that intersection where we have uh, people seeking to create profit versus people seeking to serve a specific need. Um, how we work with them is, well, we're, you know, this is what we do. <laughs> We've practiced it a lot. Uh, we know the people involved. We know the players. We develop relationships with the sales reps and the technical reps from the companies. Uh, a lot of times the best way to go about this is to work with the publisher or vendor at the very beginning to create a solution that works for you. It's easier, the, the, uh, the smaller the group it is that's doing the negotiating, the better, right? So we might say, Kim, publisher, can you help us design a deal, a package of materials, some publishing opportunities and so forth that works well for Hopkins. Hopkins is unique. We have our own needs. It's harder to do that on a bigger scale when we're working with a larger group. We call those library consortia. Um, but we like working with publishers to design something from the ground up that works the best for us. Um, 
Other than that, we do a lot of analysis. Uh, part of my job is sitting around just analyzing uh, sales pitches, looking at different kinds of offers, looking at deals made by other schools with publishers, seeing if that would work for us. We always keep our researchers' needs in mind at the top of our mind, uh, but we also, of course, have to look at the financials. Um, and so we we work really hard to, <laughs> to do that. That's that's kind of why people like me get hired is to help think uh, about these very complex deals. I will tell y'all a quick story. When I first got into libraries, my job was to buy books. I was working in a very small library. I had a budget. It was twenty thousand dollars. That's not very much. <laughs> And I opened paper catalogs all day and I would look through the paper catalogs and I would pick out books to order and I would order them on my credit card. And then they came to the library in a box and I'd get them out, put some stamps on them and shelve them on the shelf. What we do today is a lot more complex than that. It is uh, governed by these complex licenses. Uh, the deals are oh, sometimes over a million dollars for a single school and a single product. The, they're high stakes. And uh, we've had to learn to adapt to that, but the publishers are willing to work with us and we've had a lot of success with that. And I'm really proud of the work that Hawkins has done. Um, it's, uh, it's been really fun to come here and be a new person and learn about how we do this. Did I, hope I answer the question? Yes, that was great. And it's been fascinating sort of hearing about this aspect of, you know, collection strategies. Um, so we have another question in from Bill Dean. Um, he's asking, tied kind of into what you were talking about in open access, mm -hmm. does the Sheridan Libraries have a relationship with Johns Hopkins University Press yes. as a vehicle for publishing academic information and even possibly at a uh, less costly level? Yes, we do. Probably I, not in the exact way you're thinking, Bill, but uh, we do have relationships. We work closely with the press and closely with Project Muse. Uh, which is their subsi um, a subsidiary of the press. I think that's the right way to put that. And um, we, one of the best ways that I personally work with those wonderful people at the press is that they help us think through these very broad problems, kind of long-term problems. And it's so long-term, but it's also evolving so rapidly. They've really helped me as a professional understand the publishing side of it. So when I think of things, I'm naturally very library centric, but the press has helped us understand the pressures that they're under. And we are working on things together to go toward a future, frankly. I mean, the press, our press, Hopkins Press is a leader in that field and the library is also a leader in, in that. So I, I am super excited that this is uh, new for me and I love it so far. So yeah, I think um, our relationship with the press is very important in, in helping us go toward a more open future. Um. Yes, and on that subject, yes, but still on open access, we have one from Jacob here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think graduate students and faculty have different perspectives on open access and article processing charges? Oh, that's fantastic. What a great question. Yeah, um, yes is the answer to that, but I would also say, what do you think? Because I am always interested in hearing more from our grad students in particular and faculty about their attitudes, because I know that attitudes are changing. Um, we also know that attitudes about open access and APCs differ by discipline. So, for example, we can broadly say that open access and APCs are more accepted in STEM fields than in social sciences and humanities because STEM fields are more well-funded and because it's just become a cultural thing. So um, I would say that it very, speaking very, very generally, I would say that science folks are more accepting and less, um, like let's say suspicious, but in a good way where we're like, am I getting scammed? You know, uh, Science folks are more used to it, I should say. It's been part of their lives for longer. Now, we also see much higher costs. APCs are much higher in the sciences. And that is not affordable for a lot of people. 
Um, and my guess is that for grad students unaffiliated with a grant, for example, they would have a difficult time publishing open access. And I might say that grad students are in the most need of open access because they are at the point in their career where they're just establishing their reputation and they want their work to be disseminated as widely as possible. So um, I would love to hear from anybody else that uh, has an opinion on that, but I, I think that um, newer researchers may have a more open mind about it just because it's been part of their uh, scholarly life from the beginning, but they have fewer ac uh, less access to the funding required to do open access. And just for the record, my personal favorite uh, type of OA is not APC based. I do not think that APCs are a sustainable way to do open access into the future. I think that is a baby step towards something and we want to get beyond it at some point. Um, and I would like uh, I would like to see libraries and universities uh, engage more fully with what we call Diamond OA, where we put money into a pool, it's all collected together, and then that funds the entire journal title to become open access so that, that there are no author payments, individual payments per item. So I hope that answers your question, Jacob, but feel free to ask a follow-up. Great, I think we have time for just a few more questions in all of this. Um, we have uh, one here, um, more about uh, decision-making on current usage. And it says, you know, focusing investment decisions on current usage mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense, but could that lead to everyone researching the same thing from the same sources kind of over time? And how can we ensure we don't lose key insights that might reside in more obscure sources or something missed in, in different sorts of search algorithms? Perfect question. Excellent. Yes, you are thinking along the right path. So I think um, the answer is yes, that's something that we need to be cognizant of when we do decisions. And just let me say upfront that we would never, ever, ever, ever make a decision based solely on usage. That is not what we do. It is one piece of evidence that we would consider alongside a lot of other things. Uh, one of my jobs is to become familiar with the curriculum, the research areas, the emphases that are happening at Hopkins and say, how can we best support these? It's not just about today, it's about tomorrow as well. So um, we wouldn't, we would not use current usage. It is a clue and it is not the whole picture. So um, like I said in my presentation, we are tasked as librarians with considering um, non-mainstream materials. So we like to sometimes call that the long tail, the materials that are only of interest, or that we call them niche materials that are only of interest to a few people, perhaps right now, only a few people, perhaps tomorrow, more people. Um, and so I think, the way we make this, it's really important for us to paint a full picture with both qualitative and quantitative data, subjective and objective input to make decisions about the collections. It um, Using just one thing would be myopic, and um, I agree that that is one of the bad outcomes. Now, I have worked at schools where we were undergoing very bad budget cuts. And so like particularly after the Great Recession many years ago, like our budget was cut 20 percent and then 20 percent again the next year. And then I mean, it was horrible. And in those cases, usage statistics can be a quick tool to make very fast decisions in an emergency. A lot of people did that during the pandemic as well. But that's not ideal at all. So we wouldn't say that that was something we would design <laughs> and, and do on purpose. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and I think we have time for just one last question. And this one actually came from Jim, um, who said that you've re referenced art several times. How does Hopkins share art as open access? Oh, great question. We have so much art in our digital library. <laughs> that That is one way. We also do purchase and provide access to um, databases that provide, you know, art images and so forth. Uh, well, that wouldn't be open access. But um, I think I think at art is a really interesting part of open access <laughs> because it would be, I think I, I think I'm fair in saying that it would be less of a commercially produced 
thing and more of a thing supported by institutions. So we might say here is something in our collection that is an art piece. Um, the Woman of the Book is a great example of that, I think. So I think somebody's going to plug Women of the Book here in a few minutes. And so we took very ancient art and digitized it for people to see open on the web. Um, another way we support collections of art in some cases are uh, by doing web archiving because so much of uh, the current art world is online um we can make sure but it's also ephemeral it go it go it was here today maybe gone tomorrow so we can collect these rapidly evolving things by doing web web archiving projects that's less um for me that's outside of my sphere of uh expertise <laughs> but um i i maybe that's a question for another lunch for the library <laughs> someday because that's a great question jim uh, okay, well, great. Well, thank you so much, Laurel. And um, it looks like we're out of time. And I like that maybe there'll be a part two coming for lunch with the library <laughs> with scholarly research for sure to answer more questions. Um, we'd like to thank you, Laurel, for your presentation and Jim for your generous introduction. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us for this afternoon's webinar. Um, a follow-up email will be shared with all of you attending today with a recording of the program and a link to upcoming our, our upcoming event schedule. Mm -hmm. We hope you will join us for our next Lunch with the Libraries on December 5th, also at noon. This will be featuring an introduction to Women of the Book exhibition with curator Kelsey Champagne on view in the George Peabody Library Exhibit Gallery through January 31st. Following this presentation, you may tour the exhibition with curators Kelsey Champagne and Earl Havens on Wednesday, December 7th at 10 a.m. Space is limited for that tour, so we'd like you to email libraryfriends at jhu.edu to reserve your spot for the in-person tour. Complete information about this event can be found here at this link, which I will provide in the chat. Thank you again, and we hope you enjoy a wonderful weekend. Thank you for joining us.